Join us in the fight to restore liberty and American exceptionalism. Together, let's make the case that our charters of freedom are worth defending and honoring. Right here is where the great American experiment comes alive. Let's get to work. Should the Second Amendment be altered? And in this case, we have affirmative argument to supervise their performance. I'm not really in agreement with the idea that the Second Amendment should be altered. I would like to see it enforced. I may talk about altering the way we interpret it, the way that we uh, pay attention to it. Second Amendment, as you point out, is uh, 27 words. It opens up with the phrase, well regulated militia, which is the noun in the sentence. I believe the Second Amendment gives us the guidelines of what they were expecting they would get out of a militia. They wanted to be sure that their militia could have weapons to defend the nation. You notice that, before I go any further, rather than, than have you guys out there wondering, or, I mean, probably all you guys could recite it, but just to be sure, so what this is up here on the counter for, right? A well-regulated militia, comma, a necessary security of a free state, capital S state, comma, the right of people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So, to my interpretation, the well-regulated militia is the most important part of this. The idea of saying that we should not have guns, I'm not sure why the people on the right are attributing that to liberals or progressives or me, I hope not. I'm not trying to take away your guns, but I do believe that we have, that the purpose of having weaponry is to have civil weaponry. I, I would doubt that even Mr. Crozer would, Krauser, Krauser. Krauser, would support, uh, say, a four-year-old having a bazooka. So we all believe in some sort of limit of the Second Amendment. You certainly don't want to give a guy a gun right when you just made him mad. I betcha, I betcha. So you believe in some limits of the, of the Second Amendment. We all have an, an establishment of what the slippery slope is of what we're ready to have. Now, this, to me, am I saying uh, nobody should have guns? Absolutely not. I have guns myself, even though, for the most part, I'm a pacifist. This is my baby some guns as a family thing, and I didn't uh, discard them. When I left the military, I had given up weapons and violence, but uh, that, that's me. I don't want other people's religion shaping my life, their religious <clears throat> views shaping my life. To my mind, you know, uh, having a gun, uh, being obsessed with guns is worshiping destruction. It's a tool for violence. I'm not saying you can't have them, but if that's so important to you, then, you know, it's difficult to jive that with the whole idea of Christianity. Further, uh, when I talk about weaponry and violence, I want us to think about the way that weapons are marketed in America has nothing to do with the liberals' intention of taking away guns. All the news that you hear about how the president is going to take away your guns, that's just BS. That's something that the arms industry, that the weapons manufacturers hype up so they can sell more. I am not trying to take away your guns. I don't know any Democrats at all. I don't know why we keep having this discussion. To my mind, I wonder why people are so afraid that folks are after their guns. Maybe they're after my guns. Thank you. Um, where are we? I guess I'm so enthralled. Negative cross examination negative of one minute. Diane Feinstein proposed that we ban over 2,100 weapons. Uh, do you agree with what it is that she was trying to do? I gotta say, I cannot specify in particular, but I bet that you don't want everybody having a machine gun either. Well, I'll get to that, and we'll decide whether or not that but should be the case. about Diane Feinstein and the assault weapons? I, I just asked a yes or no. Do you agree with it or not? I cannot answer that, because some weapons, some assault weapons are actual assault weapons, and others are cosmetic. Uh, do you believe that the American citizen should be able to possess handguns? Yes. Nine millimeter? It's a handgun. 45? It's essentially a nine millimeter. Do you agree that American citizens should be able to possess shotguns? Yes. 
rifles. Sure. AR-15. Yeah, that's still a, it's still a rifle, it's a semi-automatic. AK-47. Modified to be automatic or not? Uh, let's just go with semi-automatic initially. Semi-automatic, yep, yeah, because I'm going to keep in uh, with the ATF laws that prevent uh, machine guns and weapons of mass destruction. In the okay, AR understood. Rifles. Now if I take that AR-15 and I put an extended stock on it, does that now become an assault rifle that you're willing to ban? I'm willing to uh, uphold the existing ban on automatic weaponry. I asked you if you put it... It doesn't matter to me now. I asked you if you put an extended stock. The length of the stock doesn't matter to me now. Muzzle compressor. You mean a silencer? A muzzle compressor. You mean a silencer? I'm saying a muzzle compressor. We're out of time. I was willing to forfeit some of my time to get you to answer some questions, but that's okay. I don't Let's go right into... I don't into why that should matter. No, I'm not particularly trying to suppress somebody's flash suppressor. Uh, <laughs> we're going to... Uh, I don't really have an argument against people. Wait. Oh, oh, that's not, that's not, that's what? Mr. Krause. What? Mr. Krause. That's what should be going next. Yeah, he's, he's... I should. Yes, we're, this is he's true. He's cross-examined me, and now we're doing his negative arguments in five minutes. Got it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm a utopian pacifist as well. I, I joined Mr. Weiser as a utopian pacifist. I believe in a world where we should all be prosperous and live in a world of peace. I believe that. And I'm willing to give up my firearms. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to join you other utopian pacifists. I'm willing to join Mr. Weiser as a utopian pacifist on one condition. I'm willing to give up my firearms on one condition. The criminals and tyrants disarm first. That's the way it needs to be. And I shouldn't have to be able to sit up here and justify my freedom. This is what Mr. Weiser is asking us to do. He asked, a rifle? Is it automatic? I don't have to justify my freedom. You, ladies and gentlemen, do not have to justify your freedom. You know what has to happen? Government must justify their infringement. See, we've turned this idea of liberty on its head. Suddenly I have to defend why I'm free and why I should be able to exercise certain freedoms. It's time for the individuals in government to justify why they think their infringements are illegitimate. Why individuals in Mr. Weiser's camp think infringements are legitimate. The fact of the matter is what we all agree on is that what we want to ban is not guns. We want to ban violence. We want to ban murder. See, in our society, I think Mr. Weiser's fallen into this trap of thinking that if you dehorn the gazelle, the leopard somehow goes away. It doesn't happen that way. If you disarm the prey, the predator becomes stronger. If you disarm the prey in our society, the criminal element becomes stronger. If you disarm the prey in our society, the government becomes overreaching and overbearing and corrupt. There's a reason why our founding fathers put the Second Amendment in place. It says the right of the people. It doesn't say the right of the militia. It doesn't say the right of the government. It says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not, shall not, I happen to believe that the words of the Constitution mean what they say and say what they mean. Shall not. Tell me where the infringement is and why you think you are okay, are okay as a philosopher king to stand up and tell the American people, we're going to take your guns. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen on our watches. Because that's not the original intent of our Constitution. I to break the quorum, but I didn't say anything about taking people's guns. And if you're going to make this argument about me saying that, then you've got to stop. Because that's not the argument that I made. Every single individual in here heard when I asked him about automatic rifle. There's no need for an automatic rifle. He said if it was semi-automatic. Don't sit here and play that game with me. Because I asked you a number of questions and automatic rifle was the red line for you. That was the threshold. And that, my friends, is a violation. What was that? So napalm. Whatever that I don't means. want my four-year-old having napalm. Yeah, well, that's not, what, that's not what we're talking about. And really, I respected you while you were making the argument. Please respect me while I'm doing the same. The fact of the matter is that Thomas Jefferson, our good friend Thomas Jefferson, he said that the ultimate check against tyranny is arms. And we want to fall into this idea that, well, arms aren't necessary anymore because we live in a civilized society. Take a look at history. These were geniuses that came together at the time of the founding. What did they do? They identified history. They identified that men and women with power could not be trusted. Limit what they do. And this Second Amendment was designed to do what? It wasn't designed to give more power to government. How absurd is this? 
How absurd is it to make the argument that we're interested in giving more power to government? The idea is that you had individuals like Edmund Randolph, Luther Martin, George Mason, who stood up at the time of the, of the vote on the Constitution, September 17, 1787, and said, we will not sign on to this Constitution. Why? Because it doesn't have a Bill of Rights. And what we hear so many people out there saying is, well, in fact, the Second Amendment was granting more power to the government. You gotta be a part of this well-regulated militia. Who defines well-regulated? Well, I guess today, in 2014, government gets to decide what's well-regulated. Well That's not consistent with the original intent. It's not consistent with the verbiage of the Second Amendment. In fact, it was Thomas Jefferson who said this, no free man shall ever be to board the use of arms. Samuel Adams, the said Constitution shall never be construed to authorize Congress to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their arms. You guys can clap, but I didn't say any of that stuff. So he's got a great hollow argument. There's no real argument there, because I didn't say that we should take away weapons. All right, um, we need to stay on, on track here. And even though I have to name switch it, I think I got it right. Um, <coughs> now we have the firm of cross-examination. One minute, uh, Mr. Watts. Okay. Yeah. So, when Mr. Crozer talks about... Krauser. 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 <laughs> It even looks you, like Krauser. You're okay, you're okay. Yeah, somebody always puts an N in my name, and it frustrates me. Um, so, how do I get back to this? Some of the things that came to mind, uh, once again, you referred to Jefferson, who was not part of the actual writing of the uh, Constitution, not saying that he wasn't an influential individual, but he was not one of the people that was there. And again, I find it interesting that you want to take away the, the capital S in state because he talks about the well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of the state. Remember, this is a historical time. People who wrote the Constitution had just... Let me just ask a question. I'll oh. make sure I ask a question. Oh. So, then let me ask you, would you provide some historical context into your assertion uh, that the uh, we're trying to keep us from, uh, this was about individual weaponry instead of creating a structure that would provide weapons for the militia that's in Article 1, Section 8. Well, he just took a minute. Do you want, how much time do I have to respond to that? About 30 seconds. About 30 seconds. Uh, I will get uh, into that a little bit more in my rebuttal, but the fact of the matter is that if you look at the text, if you look at the grammar, if you look at the way that the language is used, it's rather clear that it was protecting the right of the people. It was not protecting a so-called militia. The militia clause is a purposive clause. It outlines one of the many purposes for preserving that right. That's just a matter of simple grammar. Okay, thank you. All right, now we're in a permanent rebuttal. This is why we have five minutes. But well, once again, and, and I want everybody in this room to keep clear what it is that I'm saying instead of the straw man that he threw up that's supposed to be in front of me. I'm not talking to you about giving up your guns or suggesting that the government should have the right to take away your guns. When I asked for a limit, when he was trying to press me for a limit, I was responding to the existing limit that's in the, the national statute, the ATF laws on uh, what are limits that you can have. Like this guy here with the Denver Broncos hat in the third row. Hi kid, how's it going? Man, I think you're a fine man. I'm sure that you're a nice, good-hearted, moral person, but I just don't want you to have an atomic bomb in. It's an arm. I don't care how well you think that you're gonna behave, I don't believe that any of us want to give the power to an individual to destroy everything. And that's what we're talking about when he says, no limit, how far do you want to take this? When I say the existing limit of uh, machine guns, the existing limit of napalm bombs and anthrax, I didn't make up those limits. Those are part of the way that we operate right now. All of you individuals who are law-abiding citizens are not stockpiling the illegal weapons of mass destruction, so you're already living within a limitation 
an understanding. Remember, our laws of uh, freedoms only go as far as the next person. We have to have a, a sort of a setup where we can protect each other from each other. In fact, Mr. Kr Krauser, hey, I got it, has repeatedly referred to James Madison, and one of the things that I like to keep in mind is that he said that we had to have a government that was strong. All men are angels. We know that. So we have to have a government that's strong enough to protect us from each other, of course, but also a government that's strong enough to protect us from itself. Now, I want to keep in mind this Constitution was written at a specific point in time. This is a re remark that I was making earlier. Constitution was written shortly after a very bloody and devastating battle to make uh, America its own country. They were still under attack uh, and challenged by Britain. They hadn't established themselves so firmly that France might not have tried to pick them off, and they were just one of the smaller, weaker players on the world stage at this time. The nation needed to have a way to protect itself. They needed to be sure that citizens had weapons so they could rally for the state if necessary, and also for the people out on the frontiers where they were dealing with uh, hostile other enemy countries and hostile Native Americans, which they killed in mass. People needed to have weapons to protect themselves, to protect our country. That's clear in the state. The idea of a well-regulated militia seems to be something that people often throw out. When you say a well-regulated militia, are you infringing on the rights of citizens? I'm not sure, but if your citizens are well-regulated, they're going to have to follow some sort of rules. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Um, negative rebuttal, uh, Mr. Crowley, you have four minutes. I find it interesting. Uh, the straw man argument uh, is being done by Mr. Weiser. We want to talk about bombs and a nuclear arsenal. I want to talk about just firearms, about handguns and rifles and shotguns. We see an assault going on on, the, on these ideas and these objects all throughout the country. Connecticut, New York, at the federal level. And then Mr. Weiser wants to talk about the ATF. I got news from Mr. Weiser. The ATF is not even a legitimate bureaucracy. It's a bureaucracy that was uh, supposedly established under our Constitution, but there is no authority for the ATF. There is no authority for the ATF uh, in our Constitution. And if we want to talk about Federalist Paper Number 51, if men were angels, there would be no need for government. The fact of the matter is that men and women are not angels, therefore you must limit ultimately what they can do. Let's talk about the sentence structure. Mr. Weiser seems to be hooked on the sentence structure. Let's talk about it. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Let me give you another example to think about that is grammatically identical. A, a well-educated citizenry being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and read books shall not be infringed. Do I only have the right to keep a book if I'm a part of what the government says is a well-educated citizenry? Do I only have the right to read a book if I'm a part of a well-educated citizenry as defined by the government? That's absurd. We have the right to keep and read books with one of the ma many purposes being a well-educated citizenry. And so the same stands for the Second Amendment. You and I have the right to keep and bear arms for one of many purposes. The one purpose that was outlined by our founders was the necessary security of a free state. That was one of many, many purposes. It's absurd to take the, the position that in fact this Second Amendment was granting the government more power to regulate the individuals. You had individuals that refused to sign on to this document unless you preserve the, the liberties of the people. Consider this, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 says this, Congress shall have the power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws to execute the laws of the nation and suppress insurrections and repel invasions. Why in the world would you have an Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 that essentially nullifies the Second Amendment when, it, when the very purpose of the individuals writing the Second Amendment was to preserve individual liberty? In, in essence, to take his argument, there is no meaning behind the Second Amendment because the federal government can call up that militia at any time. That's a perversion of the text of the Second Amendment. It's a perversion of the original intent of the Second Amendment. 
If you don't like what it is that the, that the Second Amendment has to say, if you don't like the fact that the right of the people have just that, the right to keep and bear arms, there's a great opportunity to do something. It's called Article 5. Article 5. Amend the Constitution. Amend it. And if you amend the Constitution, guess what it becomes at that time? Just as rigid as the rest of the Constitution. Right now, the Second Amendment is rigid. But you have individuals in power that are doing what? They're adulterating it. They're making it something that it was never intended to be. The fact of the matter is that James Madison said, Americans need never fear their government because of the advantage of being armed, which the Americans possess over the people of almost every other nation. I intend to fight for that ideal and to provide for the preservation of the Second Amendment. Well, we've had a lot of things that we've talked about. I have enjoyed the variety of issues, but I want to go back through a couple of main points that we've had over this time. When it comes to the idea of freedom of religion, freedom from religion is just as important. Remember, our founding fathers made sure that they created a country that would protect the individual from the warring religious factions that were dominating the country at the time. When it comes to, is the Constitution a living, breathing document? Every time you make a change, you put life back into that Constitution. That's why there's been 27 amendments. Because again, our Constitution has to reflect the society that lives with it. We don't want to have a society that still uh, treats black people as three-fifths of the citizenry. We don't want to have a society that doesn't count Indians at all and considers women a child. Our society has changed, and so has our Constitution, and it will have to continue to do so. As things evolve in our country, as things evolve in the world, technology improves, we may find there's different things that we don't even know we need to adapt to. And our country was designed by brilliant men who were prepared for that adaptivity. They were prepared for a document that would last for decades, centuries perhaps millennia. When it comes to the general welfare, again, I really want to ask you people, what do you want your government to be about? Do you want it to be about excuses to not do good for society? Do you want it to build up ways to where you say, oh, this law says I don't have to care about that guy. And this law says I don't have to care about the education. He mentioned the education, he mentioned health care, he mentioned food stamps. I can't think of things that are more important to people's welfare. And not everybody is capable of functioning. We have people who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, some in this room, who are already getting public assistance, already getting the Social Security that they put into. That's part of the general welfare that I'm talking about. Our country is supposed to look out for its citizens. And when it comes to the Second Amendment, I really hope that none of you got duped by the suggestion that I'm asking you to give up your weapons or that I'm a representative of somebody who does, because that's not my issue at all. I don't know why uh, we have a country that continues to divide itself over somebody's right to have weapons, but it's not my side that's making that division. I'd like to see a country that tries to live up to its documents, tries to live up to its ideals, and we're only going to do that if we go back to the Constitution and keep it alive within us today. That's my message. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Krause. The Constitution is not about controlling people. It's about controlling individuals that we've elected to represent us. And we've constantly heard this argument throughout that apparently the Constitution is designed to control the people in some way, shape, or form, to provide something that they don't otherwise have. Well, I've got news for you. When you start talking about food stamps, that's provide to a, a, a certain demographic in our population or health care or anything along those lines. It requires something to happen. It's called theft. Taking from one demographic in order to provide to another. 
These issues are better taken care of at the state level, and our founders recognize that. You know, we, we've talked about a number of things tonight, some more directly, some in passing, but food stamps and health care and education and the ATF. We need to start asking ourselves, are these things permissible under our Constitution? Stop paying lip service to the document. Stop, stop revering the document and then ignoring its provisions. The word no means what it means. The word shall not means what it means. And when you say all legislative powers here and granted are vested in Congress, well, what are those powers? Article 1, Section 8, it means what it means. And when we talk about the executive branch, they have very few powers. The executive has very few powers. This means what we say. This say what we mean. Judicial branch only is permitted to do certain things, only hear certain types of cases. Let's mean what we say and say what we mean. Let's get back to the document and quit playing lip service as though we pretend to believe in the document, but when it doesn't convenience us, we run roughshod over it by engaging in things like health care and food stamps. Let the states deal with those. They're better suited to do that than it is the federal government. As we look at the freedom of religion, you know, you have a right in this country, if I could be so bold, to be a bigot. You have a right to be a bigot. It's called freedom. Let people be bigots. And you know what happens in a society such as ours with bigots? If you let the market do its thing, you run them out of town. You make government do it? See, this is the, what the other side believes. If you make, if you, government can somehow change the hearts and minds of Americans. It's never worked that way. Market forces, the contest of ideas, the marketplace, that ultimately can do it. A living, breathing document. Never been such a thing. Bind him down. Bind him down with the chains of the Constitution. If we're going to send people to Washington, D.C., bind them down. Bind them down. Hold them fast. General Welfare Clause restricts. That's why the clause was put there, to ensure that government was not catering to special interest groups. We mutilated that clause. And look at what's going on now. The Second Amendment, the ultimate check against tyranny, is arms. Allow the people to defend themselves. I refuse to live in a society that runs scared from the criminal, that runs scared like the gazelle. It's not consistent with reality. The Constitution is not the problem. It's the answer. Thank you so much. I agree with that last line. Good job. Mm -hmm.